If you take a look at the best high school prospects back in 2009, you see some familiar names. John Wall, DeMarcus Cousins, two players who, more or less, met their expectations. Then there's Derek Favors, the number one ranked prospect of 2009. A guy who, I feel like we've waited years for him to break out and become a star in Utah, but that just never happened. For Favors in the NBA, there were a few seasons where he made a massive jump and it looked like he could be a borderline all-star for years to come. But those hopes and dreams faded away just as quickly. How's it going folks, my name's Andy, and in this video I want to take a look at the career of Derek Favors, and how he went from being the number one prospect to having a mediocre career that saw him become a bench player by his late 20s. Anyway, without further ado, let's get started. So the first question we gotta ask is, why did he get ranked so highly to begin with? Well, by the late 2000s, the NBA was transitioning to a guard-dominated league, and Favors was recognized as the perfect big man for the modern NBA offense. At 6'10", 245, Favors had an NBA-ready body at the age of 18. His strength, his athleticism, size, plus a smooth touch around the rim and a nice mid-range jump shot. Combine all that with the length and quickness to be an elite defender. He was legit. His biggest competition, in terms of big men, was DeMarcus Cousins, who was a very different player, a more rugged, bruising traditional center who was more offensively polished. However, unlike Cousins, Favors was not plagued with the attitude issues that made scouts hesitant on Cousins. He had the right attitude, all the right tools and foundation to succeed, and a limitless potential. That's why he was considered the best big man, and arguably the best high school player in the nation. Favors was named Mr. Basketball USA and the Naismith Prep Player of the Year in 09. However, when he got to college, his stock fell a little bit. I mean, he was great at Georgia Tech, but the reason he eventually fell to the third pick of the 2010 draft wasn't because of anything he did. It was because John Wall and Evan Turner dominated in college. Heck, Turner was named the Big Ten Player of the Year, and Wall was the SEC Player of the Year. Favors was still very productive, but didn't accumulate the accolades that draft scouts want to see. In terms of his game, he still showed out. He demonstrated why he was one of the top prospects in the nation. Shortly after he got drafted by the Nets, Favors would be involved in a blockbuster trade in his rookie season. Darren Williams, the Jazz disgruntled superstar, got his coach fired and then forced his way out of Utah. In that deal, Favors was actually the primary piece that enticed the Jazz to pull the trigger on this trade. At that point, he was seen as having arguably the highest potential out of any rookie in the NBA, so even though he was having a subpar rookie year, it was worth the risk to make this trade. On February 23, 2011, at the trade deadline, Favors would get traded to Utah joining a team that was now led by two big men, Al Jefferson and Paul Millsap. Because of this, Favors was forced to come off the bench for the next two seasons. Now, some say that this was a mistake on the part of the Jazz. They kept playing Jefferson and Millsap a ton of minutes trying to grab a low playoff seed. But it's not like they were going to contend in the Western Conference with the roster they had. While fellow draft classmate Gordon Hayward quickly rose up the ranks, Favors still did not get the opportunity he should have had, to the dismay of his agent who tried numerous attempts to get the Jazz to trade him, as he felt like Favors' value was getting ruined. Eventually, with the departure of Jefferson and Millsap, Favors' role quickly increased. In back-to-back -back seasons from 2014 to 2016, he averaged around 16 points a game, 8 rebounds over a steal and a block too. It was a great thing to see, Favors moved from the bench into the starting lineup and immediately produced at a high level. The skills he was once praised for, we saw glimpses of that. Favors' ability to finish at the rim was extraordinary. It was a very high rate, over 70% of his attempts, and he had a silky smooth mid-range jumper. One of the best mid-range jumpers for a big man. However, despite his improvement, Favors' game did not scream, star. You know when you look at a guy and you say to yourself, wow, this guy, this dude is gonna be a star in the near future. Nobody thought that way about Favors. With that being said, nobody has ever said a negative thing about Derek Favors. Coach Quinn Snyder emphasized his importance to the team, even when it doesn't show in the numbers. What Derek does for us is not always apparent in a box score. 
It certainly is on nights when he has 20 points and 10 rebounds, but he does things that are unique. He can guard multiple positions. There's always a play a game where he makes a catch and you think, how did he get that? He's a fun guy to play with and he has a high level of selflessness. In those years, he became the secondary scoring option behind Gordon Hayward, but I feel like that was more so out of necessity. The Jazz didn't have any other good offensive options, so Favors was kinda pigeonholed into this role. In those years, they tried to feed him the ball in the post, they tried to put him in the high post, they tried to surround him with shooters to give him space to work in the paint. The organization freed up the power forward and center spots just to give their precious prospect the opportunity to flourish. But perhaps this was never his strong suit. I thought about Favors' place in the league over the course of his career, and he kinda reminds me of Miles Turner. Both of them are defensive studs, and at one point, offensively, their teams tried to make it work, but to no avail. And just like Turner, Favors was also in the midst of trade rumors for almost his entire tenure with the Jazz. It seemed like every year in Utah, he was going to get traded, but it never happened until almost a decade later. As his career progressed, the Jazz had the realization that Favors was better off playing center, not power forward. His skill set suits that position much better. That created a conflict because they had Rudy Gobert. A front court of Favors and Gobert was doing pretty well for a little bit. They made it back to the playoffs and had some seasons of winning around 50 games. But this front court of Favors and Gobert created a very congested offense for Utah. They wanted to build around the young Donovan Mitchell, so they needed more shooters to space the floor and give him room to penetrate and create plays. Since they weren't getting rid of their Defensive Player of the Year, the odd man out was Favors. Once they traded him away, the Jazz offense greatly improved. They became a top 5 offensive team in the league once they replaced Favors with more competent shooters. For nearly 10 years, the Jazz tried to make it work. Favors started getting inconsistent playing time as his career progressed. Sometimes he was frustrated with not being on the floor during the fourth quarter, but he never complained about it. The matchups didn't always work in his favor, especially in the playoffs, when it was hard to play two bigs at the same time. The thing is, he desperately tried to expand his game to fit in. In an article by Tony Jones of The Athletic, this is what he wrote. Favors had to make the most of it. He's worked tirelessly to expand his game, and now can occasionally make a three-pointer from the corners. When he's at the center spot, his long arms, timing, terrific hands, and leaping ability make him a prime pick-and-roll threat. But mostly, when he starts games, he hangs out in the corner in an effort to space the floor. Former Jazz player Kyle Korver added, He's more cerebral now. He used to just try and dunk on you. But now, he's developed a floater. He's expanded his game out to the perimeter. He's grown up on and off the floor. As of now, it looks like Favors is living through the twilight years of his career. Gone are the days of everyone hoping he'd explode into a superstar. But on the bright side, he still had a long, prosperous career. He's not a bust by any imagination, but he did not live up to what a former number one prospect should be. It's also kinda sad that he never made any all-defensive team. Maybe it could have been different if he was drafted to a different team and played center from the beginning. Heck, I think if he was drafted in like 2020, he wouldn't even be a power forward. He'd be a center right off the gate, because his skill set is what NBA teams want in a center these days. Who knows how his career could have panned out if that was the case. Anyway, that's all folks. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope y'all enjoyed the video, and of course, as always, let me know in the comments, and I'll see you next time. Peace.